we're now living on a planet that bears witness to these events. And engraved or inscribed into the landscape of planet Earth is the whole story, right? So a big part of what, what I do, what Brad and I do when we go out into the field is we are slowly piecing together the elements of this story, right? And realizing that it's on such a scale, it's on such a large scale that it's been overlooked up to this point. You know, the things we're looking at, like if we using the scab lands in, in Eastern Washington as, as an example, we can go on to Google Earth and we can see the, the anastomosing channeled features, the, the great erosional plexus in Eastern Washington, just, just like that, right? Within a matter of seconds, we can take it all in. It took J. Harlan Bretz over two decades, field seasons all summer, traveling by auto and foot back and forth to finally be able to map that. So 20 years of mapping before he could really look at it and see what it was, you see. Now we can see what took him 20 years to map. We can see it in five seconds. See, that's the difference. Back then, we had no perspective from space. We've got that now, see. And, and so we have all of this information. We have all these new technologies, scanning electron microscopy, for example, that, that allows us to look into the, into the very small realm of reality and see things like nano diamonds and micro spherules. But on the other hand, we have now the telescopes that allow us to look out into the larger cosmic neighborhood and begin to see um, that, that, yeah, we're part of a much bigger system. And here's, here, see, here, here's one of the assumptions it has been that up until this time, Earth has been an enclosed system. And the only input and output is solar radiation coming in, you know, uh, short wave solar radiation coming in, long wave radiation being re-emitted back out, right? In that scenario, the sun has been perceived as a constant. It's not shifting. It, its output is not changing. Its radiative output is remaining constant and steady. And so because you're thinking that it's unvarying, this, this input and output allow, essentially allows you to ignore it in the model, see? So, but now we're suddenly having that called into major question. The sun maybe isn't as unvarying as it was assumed. In fact, maybe there's evidence that the sun is, is much more variable than, than had previously been assumed. And so up until this time again, Earth is basically a closed system. We can ignore the input of the sun because it never really changes. So anything else that's changing would be the result of things other than the sun, see? But what we have to do now is understand that the whole solar system is in fact a system and it's operating in unity. What's going on with the big outer planets is affecting the sun. The evidence for that is is now overwhelming. What is happening in this sun is affecting what's happening on the earth. Maybe not just the climate of the earth, but things like volcanism and seismicity and tectonic activity and so on. See, so the idea here now is we have to begin looking at the big picture. Um, and I think that would be one of the, one of the things that um, would be a theme that, that ties a lot of these together. And then, you know, when we look at, um, we, when we look at the traditional interpretation. We look at that same kind of insight, but through a more traditional lens. We see things like the Hopi Indians saying, well, the, the, the four disasters that preceded this world ended because humankind forgot to pay attention to the plan of the creator. Yeah. In other words, failed to look at the big picture. And, you know, in the Bible, it's um, as the people were eating and, well, somebody asked, you know, Jesus, when, and I'm not trying to proselytize Christianity here. Now I draw from <laughs> all religious traditions, right? One of the, one of the, uh, one of the disciples asked Jesus, when will we know when the next, when, when, you know, when the apocalypse, apocalypse comes? And he says, well, as it was in the days of Noah, when the people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that the flood came and swept them all away, so will it be again in the coming of the, in the days of the coming of the son of man, which is simply a metaphor for the cycle completing itself, right? We can find that idea embedded in all kinds of traditions. The idea that we're not paying attention 
And because we're not paying attention, we're, we're, we're vulnerable. See, in the biblical verse, it's not saying, oh, well, there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. No, that's part of the everyday life. But the problem becomes if that's your exclusive realm of attention to the point where you're ignoring the larger world. And that's when you're going to get into trouble. Yeah. You know, when, 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 when we lived up in rural Minnesota, we knew that there were certain sky conditions that foretold that there were probably tornadoes on their way, right? You could see things that usually when they came out of the West, right? Think about a tsunami, right? Tsunamis always give forewarning, don't they? I mean, if you're just like in the tsunami in Indonesia, what happens is that the shallow bays, the water recedes out of the shallow bays, right? Now, what happened was many thousands of people died because they didn't understand what nature was telling them was about to happen. So when the water receded, they happily went out and started collecting shells and fish and everything that are laying on the newly exposed seafloor, right? And now here comes the wave, see? But the ones that were educated and, and knew the, the language of nature understood what was happening when, 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 when the, uh, the waters in the base swept out and exposed the bottom of the bay, they knew that that water was now piling up into this great wave that was going to be coming. See, so that's a big part of it is understanding these forces and where we are within the cycle of things. And, and just as we might locally prepare for a hurricane or a volcanic eruption or a tornado or even a drought, whatever the case may be, we as a global civilization need to begin putting the pieces in place to be able to survive an event and, and, and lay the groundwork for a sustainable civilization. And I think we can do it. I think we can do it, but we don't have forever. That's the problem. And see, again, when we're talking about this, you can say, well, it's going to, there, there's inevitably going to be another disaster. We cannot prevent that at this point. Okay, but is it going to happen a thousand years from now or a hundred years from now or 10 years from now? We don't know. We don't know. But the point is, is you be prudent and prudence would dictate that you assume that it could happen sooner than later. And you basically put the pieces in place, just like the thing I talked about on Russia uh, today, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the sun and what would happen in the aftermath of a Carrington level event, which, which is something we know happened back in the 1850s, right? I would, I would recommend anybody who's watching this to go on to, to our, um, Russia today and look, listen to that. And it's very short. It's only, I think five minutes, but the essential idea is that an event equivalent to one that happened in the 19th century, if it happened today, could basically take down our entire communication system. And we could find ourselves large swaths of the planet could be without power for weeks, right? right? The satellite system could be completely decimated. Um, this is not this is not a fantasy. This is a very real thing that could happen, right? And I'm not saying, oh, it's going to happen next year. Hopefully not. But it could. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And and having seen it happen, just a, you know, 150 years ago, and and the consequent because it basically took down the 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 incipient telegraph system that was just going into place. I mean, you actually had, um, you know, uh, telegraph operators sitting at their station getting. Uh, getting electrocuted, not to death, but having, you know, getting um, electrical shocks off of their equipment, having their equipment burst into flames, having, um, having the wires burn out and stuff. And that was because of Earth got struck by a solar flare, right? So w there are things that we could do, for example, to harden our system against those kind of effects. We're not doing that right now, see? And that was kind of part of what I was trying to get at on Russia today is things that we could do, but we're, we haven't done them yet. So until we do those things, we're, we're vulnerable. And, and, and a Carrington level event happening today would have enormous consequences. And it would really put a lot of people through a lot of trauma and stress if it happened. 